and is it Recording is in progress. Thank you, Zoom. Uh, this uh, episode of the Greg Troyan Show brought to you by Zoom. We are paid by Zoom. We get all the monies. We are corporate shills. And we have uh, a very special guest here with us today, Mr. Michael Dyer of Grand Slam. So, sir, thank uh, you so much for, for joining us. It's an absolute pleasure to finally get here, Greg. Uh, we know the story which we went through the uh, hell and high water to get here, but we finally made it. We, 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 did, we did make it. Uh, so uh, the big question, uh, like the main question I w- want to ask is, uh, how easy is it to fill in for Phil Linet? I <laughs> would, if I was a very stupid man, I'd answer that very quickly, wouldn't you? And I come out with a cocky answer, but being a person who, A, nobody can fill in for Phil, uh, but there's an interesting story, which is kind of, it kind of, it goes full circle. And I think the, uh, the Thin Lizzy fans and the diehards will actually appreciate it. And I know Phil certainly appreciates it. And I've spoken to Scott and I know Scott, uh, I worked with Scott quite some time ago, a long time ago. But basically, when Thin Lizzy played, what was it? It was, you're going to be far better than I am, uh, opening with timpani drums, you do anything you want to do. It was the Black Rose tour. Yep, that's Black Rose, yeah. And I was a kid, a little fat kid with uh, from Liverpool with spotty face and long hair, went down there and... Uh, Absolutely had a spiritual experience. I, I, I went through a period of my life where I saw Bon Scott for the first time uh, with the Let There Be Rock tour, which was kind of 76, 77. And I was spoiled. And then I had a gig which really stood out, which was the Black Rose thing. It absolutely blew my mind. But I actually went to Stage Door and had a chat with Phil afterwards and he signed and he was absolutely lovely and inspiring and humble and talk to me like an adult and lo and behold a few years later I was touring the world with um, with Lauren's first time round in uh, our first band which had nothing to do with um, Grand Slam Lenders or anything it was a band called Rhode Island Red uh, but I'd previously been with that with a Liverpool band called Tokyo and we we, we had a little bit of success and it was uh, we got had a bit of a real cult following but it was something that it was one of those experiences where I thought most rock stars that I would meet, and I've met many in my life, and as you, you know, Mick Jagger told me never to name drop, but it was something <laughs> that, that, that basically, with regards to Phil, he, he was one of the good guys. He stood out. He was normal. Uh, he was very, you know, very humble, very, and I have this Irish connection um, where a friend of mine um lives next to the guinness family and 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 garrick brown and god bless him he he passed away a couple of years ago but it was a whole irish thing with rory gallagher um the dubliners and lizzie were on the periphery but rory gallagher was very much there the pogues were there and i was i was there i was a little scouser who who just fitted in and i'd be singing and doing my bits and pieces and i was blessed but with regards to phil the life, my life went on and, and that was the only experience I had with Phil. And then I actually worked with Scott Gorham with his 21 Guns thing briefly. Uh, but the weird thing was at Christmas 20, oh, 2017, uh, literally Christmas Day, uh, about 12 o'clock, the phone rings and my wife answers the phone and it's Lawrence. And Lawrence, she, he just shouts up and says, it's Lawrence on the phone. I went, Lawrence who? And the last time I saw Lawrence was 25 years, 27 years before that. We met at a bike show. We met at a bike show at the uh, NEC uh, bike show. But it was this thing where he was on a mission. And I understand and I understood his, his whole mission, really, because he was on a mission not to emulate, but he'd had these songs that he'd written with Phil for a long, long time. And it's very sad because I've known Lawrence for a long, long time and he's as straight as you get. And it, it's the, the whole thing with, when you work with somebody like Lawrence, he's, he wears his heart on his sleeve very much so, but he, the provenance of the songs, you can see that when Phil sadly passed and things got very blurred after that, 
a lot of the provenance of the songs that Lawrence had actually gone there. I've, I've heard the original demos before even Phil's voice was on, and then I've heard the demos with Phil's voice on. And then, and then I've heard things like, um, I got sent the material and it was a privilege. It was an absolute weird thing. I've done my whole life. I've done a journey of theater and, and rock and roll. And I've worked with some of the finest people from Diana Ross to Eric Clapton. I've worked in musicals and Jesus Christ Superstar, but my heart pounds when I play rock and roll. And I think the most tribal sound I find is that Celtic thing that Lizzie did. I am a Lizzie fan, but I'm not one, a mega fan. I'm not a fan. Of, you, you would wipe the floor with all your knowledge of what you know, but I know something that's good. And I kind of took the, the, the three days walking around the house after Christmas. I mean, I knew it was serious when somebody phoned you up on Christmas Day. Uh, but when Lawrence spoke to me and we had all these things and everything felt as if it was yesterday conversation. He's like a brother to me. He's born on November the 9th, I'm the 11th. We've got lots in common. We were quite passionate about what we do. But I went to bed and I, I started having nightmares and it was the song that got me was a song called Sisters of Mercy. And every time I heard it, it, it just haunted me. I could hear Phil's voice. I could hear him breathing on the tracks. and they weren't the finest performance of Phil, and he would be the first person to say it because sadly, um, somebody put the, 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 those demos out and you and I both know it. When something's not ready, even if a Lego set's not ready, you don't want anybody to see it. It's something where Freddie Mercury, David Lee Roth, you name it, whoever puts something out in that state, it's, it's, it, he was work, it was all work in process. And I think it was very unfair that those songs even got put out. So Lawrence was very aware of that. And he was very upset about that in the sense that the songs were never represented and Phil never wanted them to be out there in that state, even though they played a, few, a couple of the songs live. At, um, I know they did a castle festival in Ireland and uh, the, you know they did a, a, a quite an extensive tour at the time. But it was something what that sort of... Um, it was almost holy grail to me uh and i can i remember listening to the lyrics and i got up in the morning and my wife turned around and said so are you going to do it then you're going to go for it and i went no nah, i can't step into the boots of phil in it you know i can't step into phil in its shoes and my little girl then aged five florence turned around and said your shoes are big enough dad you've got loads of shoes you can wear your own shoes you don't have to wear phil's shoes and I kind of laughed at the time, but then I thought, well, I've been stepping the stage. I've been on the stage since, you know, since I was 19. And I'm a little bit older now, as you can see, through life's uh, journey. But yes, I could wear my own shoes and I'm not trying to emulate. But the one thing that I can relate to Phil and many people from Dublin, I, I'm, Dublin to me is my second home you know it's my heart my heart's in Dublin my heart's in Liverpool Liverpool and Dublin and I basically when I go out there the the rhythm of the language the rhythm of Phil's speech the rhythm of his poetry you know it, it it's very same intonation for me so I don't have to try to be Phil I don't have to try just I'm just myself and at first you know you pro I remember seeing one of your um your um, cast, and I thought, I watched it, in t and I thought, oh God, here we go, Greg, what, what the hell's he gonna do to this? And it was the hit the ground. And I thought you were very, very fair. I thought you were absolutely bang on with your analogies and how the song were pieced together. Uh, you were pretty bang on. That, I was very impressed with that, by the way. Oh, um, thanks. Yeah, I thought you were very honest and you, you you might never have seen us again and we might have faded off into the You're the still on the list. There's still there's still the, songs on yeah. the list. So it'll yeah. whenever the computer decides I have to do it, I'm gonna do it. So That's I just right. I have no idea. No, it's brilliant. And it's something that um I think that you know, listening to those songs and seeing Lawrence breathe his fire, he's been carrying those songs, hearing various versions and people doing things and and you know Lizzie is sacred but you know Phil was very very much part of, of Thin Lizzie 
And I think, you know, I, I, it, it, as, as front men go, I, I, I think that, you know, you, you've got to be, you've got to put a massive big stamp on that. And when you hear Phil's vo voice, it, it's, it's just a one off. You know, I, I listen to what people say and his, his whole delivery is very unique. He's got a very strange timing frame. It's almost like a Sinatra timing frame. You can hear bits of Elvis in there at times. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm not a black man from Dublin at that period of time. So I'm, you know, I'm a six foot four scouser and I am privileged to be paying homage, tipping my cap to, but also moving on in, in my journey and Lawrence's journey. Lawrence has got, we've got so much more new material. We've got a couple of songs which we're going to tip our hat to on the next two, uh, next album with, uh, to, um, to Phil. Um, Phil's there. He's definitely there. He helped us out, you know, in many ways at times. Uh, but it's certainly not anything which is weird where we're super freaks and trying to resurrect something. It's very much a, a Grand Slam. You know, we were even thinking at one time Grand Slam AD to move on. You know, I know Dom and I, after disease, if you like, after the plague. Um, but that Celtic thing has always been in my heart. You know, I've always, I, I, I listen to the loads of Celtic stuff when I was a kid and I'm a, a rock and roll man. But uh, yeah, I'm going off on one, Greg. You, you Correct me. Come on, bring me back to it. There must be some questions you'd like to last, ask about Hit the Ground. I mean, well, so that's, the, you know, the the main crux of it. So the, like you mentioned the the video, so you saw that. Um, and I, I always try to be like as, as fair as possible with my um, reviews and critiques because I think, because yeah. I am also a musician. Um, largely retired at this point because i just i got sick of all the hassles with it and uh books they don't hassle you as much you just you just type away yeah. and just you don't have anyone else bothering you except the demons in your head um <laughs> but but you know I, I i know like the the heart and soul that goes into it the amount of work the emotional turmoil the you know the money the the time investment so i understand all that so i always try to be like think like would i say this you know to the person's face and yeah, you know absolutely. that's that's how I try to do you know try to do it respectfully, and yeah, uh, I and I was you know generally impressed with. That. I thought Lawrence's playing was really good. I think you know you ultimately had the hardest job on the record because you had the most to prove because you are stepping into you know Phil's shoes, singing those melodies that the fans like, have heard for so many years, and yeah. then for the you know the new original material, I assume you had some uh, involvement in the lyrics. Absolutely. That's my forte. I, that's what I do. I've been writing lyrics for a long, long time. I've written musicals and I've written for ghost writers and I've written for other songs. I've written songs for Eric Clapton. I've written songs for various people, not as successful as I'd like them to have been, but, but it, the journey and the process has been, has been an absolute, you know, wonderful, but it's something where those songs on the album are specifically Gone of the Days that was a song which Lawrence kept playing this uh, riff, but it just kept taking me back to a place called The Tap, which was a bar I used to go to down in Liverpool on the coast of uh, Wirral. And all my mates are there. There's the Snatch MCC. It's a bike club. It's massive, friendly, big space of area that's never really been discovered in England. It's a little secret haven. And that, to me, was something where I reminisce of people, including Phil, of who had just, you know, been taken on the journey that we go through and thinking what they would be doing now if we were standing there at the bar. And it was just all those friends we'd lost on bikes. So that was a song, Gone of the Days, very much penned by myself in, you know, uh, helped by, uh, you know, the odd bits and pieces and direction from everybody. Benji's a bit of a poet in his, his own right. And we, everybody sort of chips in, but, this first album, um, yeah, um, I'm trying to think what else was on there. There's things like Crime Rate, which now especially where I am in, in London, where I could go outside my door and there's 14-year-old there's kids getting stabbed and all because of their postcodes, the wrong postcode, being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Mm -hmm. And I think if Phil was around and listening to the lyrics of Crime Rate, this album uh, that we that we released in 2019 uh, hit the ground, or uh, has got 
so many relevant songs of what we've just been through. Even the title 19, I suddenly cringe halfway through it when you think people, you know, the, it was almost like crime rate because of the knifings and the country had gone mad. And we both have cra crazy leaders, I think, at the time. And, and we've got an absolute Muppet as a leader at the moment, uh, which sort of saturates through when people lead by example, the country sort of follows suit. But, you know, at the moment, we've we've got Coco the Clown as a as a as a prime minister you know who who he's basically whenever he pledges a promise you you know it's a lie waiting to happen and and he's made me political he's made me feel that i've got a voice for many people i've seen many people going through this lockdown who are rockers and rollers and they're all doing the bits and pieces but i've seen so much mental damage during this period of time it's it's heartbreaking you know so i think that i think we've, we've got a duty to do uh I, I take on the responsibility and i think that when we went out there i think i've never seen audiences like what i've seen in the few gigs that we've done that we've managed to fit in between lockdown we, we went out to sergi in france and we went to bully saint means uh just outside um just on the on the board further north and uh, the people were just outrageous and real outrageous lizzie fans and they had so much memorabilia and lawrence was signing pictures of him and phil and you know tons of stuff that people had found but they were so warm and almost seeing another generation of seven-year-old kids on the the shoulders who were well aware of you know uh, any songs that oh, half the Lizzie catalog venue. Um, you know, we make a point that we are playing um, Grand Slam um, songs which were never completed, that Lawrence had part and parcel of writing. And I think that's the safest journey that we can do. I don't want to get into being a tribute band or anything like that. We've got so much material to do. And I think there's so many people doing it very, very, very well. You know, there's lots of stuff out there doing it. Uh, I think we're going to go out to Phil's uh philo um bash um which we're looking forward to and doing a few gigs in uh dublin um which is going to be absolutely fantastic so uh, we can go and stand next to phil and see him outside the cafe i'm sure you've done that have you been there i have, I have not i am a yankee oh. i have not uh crossed the pond uh because uh, they don't pay americans very well and so i can't afford it uh <laughs> so that's just uh, the the truth yeah, of yeah, the yeah. the American oligarchy. I'll get there eventually. Yeah, um, yeah. You know, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm young, uh, or you know, not anymore. But anyway, um, yes, you are, you bastard. Excuse <laughs> me. No, you're fine. Um, <laughs> so, how would you, uh, you know, let's? I'm trying to think, like, you know, how hardcore I want this interview to go. So, I'm going to give you the option. Do you want to talk about your political beliefs, or do you want to compare to Black Star Riders and what you think of what they're doing? I Which could, one do you feel is more dangerous and more uncomfortable? That's the one we should go the, for. The most dangerous is probably the Black Star Rider one, isn't it? All right, let's do it. So let's get yeah. let's but, let's compare yeah. what you're doing to Black Star Riders. Let's get hey. that pissing contest going. Okay, here we go. Go on, fire away. So how do you feel? Because so the the way I look at it, and I you know trying to be uh, as objective as possible. Yeah. You you both st sort of started off from a similar place, and so yeah. you're both sort of carrying the torch of Phil's legacy. It's a bit different because Lawrence had that personal investment. Like, these are songs I wrote with Phil that just yeah. never got out the way I wanted to, so, to. And so as a guy who has, like, you know, like 400-plus demos lying around, like, I get that, where you just want the yeah. songs to be out there. You wrote them. They're yours. And you just happen to write them with a legendary rock star who unfortunately passed away. So yes. I get that desire. And then with Black Star Riders, they were just, feeling inspired musically they decided to make a new lizzie album but then they felt you know what it doesn't feel right to call it lizzie without phil we don't want to do that and so even though these are all lizzie inspired songs they were going to be lizzie songs we felt it was more honorable to change the name even if it hurts us marketing wise which i thought mm -hmm. was very cool very classy and that first album was great and then they kind of went their own direction which is their right as artists you have to be yourself. You have to be sincere. You can't just mimic someone else. You can't be no. held hostage no. by their ghost. You have to be you. But that said, the songs aren't as good. Like, it's just they kind of just, you know, they produced in um, 
the second album in Franklin, Tennessee, which is a stone's throw away from where I am in Nashville. And I just, I know what the producers told them and what they came out with. And it's like, ah, this just sounds generic and kind of dull and lifeless. And it's, it lost that vibrancy. And so you guys are still in the first album stage where you have the, the fire and energy and you've got the continuing the legacy thing and it's great. But then the question is, you know, with that second album, will, you know, the risk of like going stale, uh, you know, and losing some people, not necessarily saying that you wouldn't, but you know, you have to follow yourself, be true to yourself. So we're, so that's, that's, you know, where I see the risk. Uh, How do you view the situation? I think the fact that this album is going to be a jazz funk fusion album. Oh, then I'm in because I'm look because I'm about I'm no because I actually think that's awesome because the thing no, is no. with uh, with Phil he would be willing to experiment and he, I think that's the writers isn't willing to experiment as much with regards to what Black Star Black Star Riders are doing. I think hats off to them. To me, I think it's an energy that somebody feels inspired. I think. We're all inspired by everything. I know it's a melting pot uh, of uh, everything. Um, you know, my, my first biggest influence in, on my life are the Beatles and probably Maybe the Elvis. band, so good choice. Yeah, Beatles, my, my number one. I don't think there's anything else anywhere near. You are uh, correct, sir. Yeah, what you can do in that period of time in seven years from, you know, and to hear Helter Skelter lyrics with Paul McCartney's voice is the first heavy metal vocal I've ever heard that brings tears to my eyes. And every time I hear Paul McCartney's voice, even with Maybe I'm, a- Maybe I'm Amazed and songs like that, I'm gobsmacked. And I think I think the Black Star Rider question to me is the Black Star Riders are the Black Star Riders and they're a fucking great rock band, apparently. I don't know anything about them. I work with Scott. Uh, I hear people mentioning, uh, I think, is it Ricky? Yes. Ricky, I think Ricky's a great front man. I agree. Uh, I think he's I think he's probably more genuine coming from that part of the world. Uh, but then Liverpool, Dublin, there's nothing to do with Phil there at all. It's just the energy of Phil. It's the energy and the the Celtic and the and the fact that Phil turned it into something which was a three-dimensional. It was a flat thing at first. And then, you know, this kid who comes from um you know, his dad from, I, th- I believe, I believe that he, uh, Phil was um, consummated in Liverpool and they moved to to um, just outside Birmingham. And, you know, I think, I love the, the, the things where, you know, Parisian walkways, I, I remember Paris in 49. I didn't realise that Paris was his father's name and 49 was the year Phil was born. And I like all that connection. I think with regards to whenever you hear that twin guitar, even Boston slightly touched on it, you know, with more than, more than a feeling, you, you can't help but go back to that Lizzie first sound, you know, and, and the guitarists they've had with Lizzie have been, you know, they've been second to none. Um, by far, the, you know, the most pretty and, and cool looking geezers that I, you know, had battles with when I was a a young rocker looking at and thinking, crikey, you know, but having met, met, you know, I've met John Sykes, I went to Blackpool years ago where he's based, I've met lots of these people and I know that everyone's human, but the point that you pick up on is the fact that, or any audience around the world anywhere will pick on, pick up if you're, if you're a flake and if you're not sincere and if you're not going for it and if you're not willing to bleed for the audience because... I kind of like that attitude that you go on stage. And, and for me, in this twilight part of my journey in rock and roll, it's something where every gig means something to me. Every gig I know could be taken away from me. I spent three years in a wheelchair following a road accident when I was 17. They were going to amputate my right leg. I got hit by a drunken magistrate. Um, so... The justice system was kind of unfair, but that underdog thing is something that I can relate to with Phil being a black kid with an abscess in his voice where everybody thought he was singing Husky at first. And then somebody said, I think you should have an operation. And he had the op- he got had this abscess removed and then he got that full, you know, down from the glen, that total mm-hmm. busy voice, you know, and that richness. But it's something where I think that if you're not hungry with this music, 
then the music's gonna you cannot you cannot just play this music it, it, it it's it's it has to be performed it has to be tribal it has to be in this the the different frame of mind i'm in at this moment in time it's almost it's almost as if you're going into battle with a viking front line and you're banging your your, your shields it's something which is that powerful that passionate and i think i think um you know what i've heard of of um of of black star riders you know fine fine not that they, i hope they make as much money as they can and i hope they're as successful as they can and i mean that sincerely i don't i don't care if there's 25 derogatives of i i look at you know it, it doesn't it, it doesn't bother me it's sort of you know it's there no, I mean, I don't, I don't wish them ill success. I just wish the no. music I was more into is what it is. But I believe that, they're sincere. I do not believe you, insincerity I, for a second. Totally. I know that you, having seen your, your blogs, I know that you're a connoisseur of what you're talking about. I know you're an expert of what you say. So uh, as a performer, it would be, I think it looks really naff if I turned around and said, you know, Scott's fingers, he plays weird or whatever. Right. The guy the guy's delivered all his life he's been there seen it done it and does it very 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 well that's that's the thing that you know that's the thing that is all that matters to me but i could never comment on on their album i could never comment on uh i could never comment on any thin lizzie songs really even though i listen to them and i know now what i know and hearing how seeing scraps of paper of lyric you know mm -hmm. uh, you frozen them for a second, Greg. Your picture, oh. your picture was frozen for a second. No, but yeah, I was just thinking. Oh, um, yeah, the 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 depth of Phil's lyric, and I feel that when Lawrence gave them to me, uh, gave them to me, there was there was five songs. Well, hang on, where are we? We had uh, uh, Crime Rate. Sisters of Mercy, 19. 19 was totally complete, obviously. It was there and mm -hmm. it was beautiful and Lawrence had written it and it, was, it drives, it drives, it drives. Um, but when I listened to Sisters of Mercy, again, was absolutely complete, complete and haunting. But then there's other songs which were crazy, for example, all crazy. Um, that every time we'd done that song, even when I did it with the first time around with Lawrence, it was always lacking some lyric. There was always lyrics that Phil had written bits and pieces, but had never completed. There were ideas. So for me, it's almost like, you know, how can you paint little bits of a picture that's been painted by Rembrandt and suddenly stick in a few bits and pieces? So you kind of, you have to tread very, very carefully. But mm. I think when I listen to All Crazy, and I, I think Phil would say, yeah, it was all right. I mean, you know, I think he'd look at me and, and yeah. And, and, and because that's my life, that's my feeling. Every word to me has to do something. If it's there for no reason, then it's, it, 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 you know, it, it's not efficient. And I think Phil was very efficient, but seeing his lyrics from going from you know listening to the black rose album i remember sitting there almost bopping along to sarah you know listening to sarah and um then i remember yellow peril coming along and thinking what the hell's going on here because phil really got into that electro sound which was which was well ahead of the the game but it was probably head enough where technology at the time wasn't giving him the sounds that you know that we know that we can create now if you were that way inclined but he was onto the winner already bless him you know that band had it there already and it was the fire it was the burnout it's the whole fire that they had to go out there and you know be defeated by certain situations and you know it's the journey and i think that i think that that sound and that energy you seriously have to dig up because I think you owe it to Phil for that song to be delivered as best as it can be. But more importantly, I owe it to Lawrence who wrote the song in the first place, who's standing next to me alive and looking at me pulling faces or, you know, it's, uh, and Lawrence is an absolute stickler for his perfection. You know, he's, he's almost obsessive with regards to the guitar thought pattern. He's, mm. he's, a natural. and I would even say that he's playing better now than he's ever played in his entire existence um i think that's probably fair i think that 
his performance on the album was was truly spectacular. It and is. It's you can feel like the passion and fire in the plane, and that's something that's you know it's it's harder to do as you get older. It is. It, it is. is. It was very hard to do that to play is. with the. Because like you just you just become a different person. The, yeah. the piss and vinegar you have in your early twenties, and the amount of fire you can feel from music, and so like even, I, I so I'm it, it's very impressive. Like you guys did a, a bang up job on that album. It was it was it was not easy to do. So. And and the other thing that you've you've kind of got to take into consideration, not kind of, it's it's an absolute given. Got to take that back. Is the engine room? We've got the most craziest engine room um that drives it and you know phil was a uh, very much driving it with the intonation when i was listening to him singing what was it um i'm actually going to be doing a gig uh in about three days in spain and I'm, one of the songs is uh don't believe a word i think and you know i don't i don't particularly want to jump into any of these things but when i listen to it and really listen to it you hear the push, you hear the push, and you can hear the push of him pushing on the bass note. So his vo vocal and his bass are really delivering this type thing. And that's where I think that it's so vital to get that bass sound, you know, that bass mm -hmm. sound private. Benji, our drummer, is, is, is if you locked him in, a, you know, if I, I literally could hear him recording the takes and I couldn't hear the track, but I could hear the track that he was playing. It was so musical. And I think when you hear him playing, you know, um, Sisters of Mercy or your typical Lizzie's celtic -y feeling, you've got an animal at the back driving it. And, and that's what Brian Downey was. You know, he was a complete military paradiddle, paradiddle freak and tight as anything. And you need that. Um, there's so many bands going around there without that drive because the guitarists don't realise that the, the engine room is so vital. Uh, that's the thing that, I think is is the unit, is the tight unit. I think as soon as you start getting to the point where, you know, this band to me is something where Lawrence came along, it was definitely his situation where he needed to, he needed to spew this material that had been festering him, that was so bloody good that needed to get out in the outside world. And no matter what happened, it's, you know, if whatever it was named, whatever it was called, it was it was hats off to the fact that we actually got it out there in the first place. But this second album is something where I feel as if I can now spread my wings, and I think we're all feeling the same way. We can we can start experimenting. Experimenting is the key. But we, without doubt, we've got that tribal. Uh, you know, we've got that Celtic tribal thing going. I think that's something which is a nice pointer it's the noise that comes out of my mouth it's very easy to sing like that i'm not trying to sound like anybody and lawrence plays that you know widdly giddly guitar like a like a you know like a diva you know he's 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 just natural to him and i've never seen fingers have you seen his fingers they're like my fingers are long they're big but his are like sausages and i don't understand how he can actually find those notes but he's you know he's uh he's apt and uh yeah we're, we're just about to go into a situation now where i'm going to get on a flight on monday first time out of the country oh no we went out to france but we i'm writing with um lawrence for 10 days on the start of the new album so we got a couple of songs which we which we are excited to get going so we're in sunny spain and then back here and then we start our little tour with a band called FM, uh, which we do the UK and a few international dates. And then we hopefully, I want to get over to your side of the pond where, where it really is happening, where there's connoisseurs like your good self. And uh, I, I think the, uh, you know, born. if to be completely objective, America is not a good rock market uh, in terms of the, the fan base they are they like what they like and they they don't like trying new things uh so it's a, it's a pretty close-minded market so i am a particular connoisseur and there are connoisseurs but like you know america is the country that decided thin lizzy should be a one-hit wonder so i would not say we are particularly tasteful in our uh in our rock preferences no no but you you i think you i think you've got some uh you know, any any country that produced the Eagles or uh, 
Van Halen or, you know, you, I could go. Oh, yeah, no, we, 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 there's a ton of great American bands. Like, I'm not saying that, well, but I think the, the audience, I think, is not as sophisticated. Like, they look at a band like Slade and they're just like, this doesn't make sense to me. Is this supposed yeah. to be rock or is this yeah. supposed to be silly? And they yeah. can't understand, like, you can well, do both at the <laughs> same time, buddy. Which is humor tends to go out the window a lot with with a lot of Americans because I think it's so cryptic. And I think the music is quite cryptic because we split genres to the the point of everything, you know. But right. The, and I, the I think that they, they just like it. It's got to be one genre. It has to fit in the box. And um, me as a sophisticated listener, like here's what I would want from a Grand Slam album, to, uh, number two. I would want, here, here's what I would want. I would want you more of your personality i want some of your musical theaterisms in there i want like piano honesty i want you to break out of the fill box and be you unless you is like all like 12 slow blues songs in which case i'll be bored but i want the weird stuff i want you to experiment and also uh gay boys because that's a great song that was left off it is an out it's a song that keeps coming backwards and i um uh, i don't really know it but i'm nervous of it but I'm I mean, not no, th- it's 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 a fantastic song. It's also like hella intimidating to do, but it's yeah. it'd be it'd be amazing. But I think like yeah. you have this wide breadth of musical knowledge. You have this wide tapestry that you can pull from because you've worked with so many different artists. You have that variety of tastes. And like you know, the Beatles, they would expand you know genres. They would do all kinds of different things. And uh, oh, looks like you're the frozen one now. Uh, oh, but you're back. But I'm saying. There's uh, there's a frustration I have with the modern rock scene where it's all just it's all playing it very safe. They're not willing to yeah. do the different genres, and I think you know a lot of Americans they want their music safe. But I think that what you guys should do is like be true to yourselves, like and you know it break out of that Phil shell, but don't just be a standard rock band. Yeah. I think that is the, that would be a I great don't. curse for you. I don't think if you interviewed any one of the guys in the band, and this is very rare, you'd ever hear a front man saying this, but you can see the energy of each member. I mean, uh, Benji's got even, even more off the scale with his, with his energy at the moment because he's just got married to a beautiful uh, uh, lady from Spain. That'll give you some energy. Uh, which is, it's calmed, <laughs> him down. it's calmed him down in many ways, which is, which is a good thing. But he's as happy as Larry, and the ba- we, we, our bass player, um, Rocky, Rocky Newton. Um, you know, he's 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 responsible for all the vocals on Hysteria album, all the high vocals um, working with Mott Langer, and his history is fantastic. He's he's in the band. Uh, he's just been around, and he's just that grounded, solid pumping energy engine. Uh, you know that you need, and Lawrence and I. Uh, you know, we've got our little bits and pieces, but we know our places. He knows, can you write lyrics this? What do you want? Something to do. It feels a bit sea-like. Okay. And then suddenly a, a, song, a pirate song or whatever it's called. Mm-hmm. We go off on one. We know our areas, which at one time you'd have, you well and, know, well and truly know probably when you're sitting in the studio as a bunch of kids, a 21-year-old, and the bass player goes to the toilet and you can see the the spade is getting pushed up and when the bass player comes back in, he can't even hear his bass. And then it's all, it's very spinal tap. And I think rock and roll to me is very spinal tap in many ways. I never thought it was, uh, I thought, I, in fact, I think we were more like spinal tap at the beginning of our little journey with, with the, the chemistry we had finding out because we'd all, we're all fully grown men that kind of have our opinions, have our, you know, political opinions, have our outlook of life. And some people are very difficult to even open their eyes and see different things. I, I think I'm pretty open. I think I've set it, you know, if, if, musically, I've, 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 I've taken in as much as I like. You know, there's always new stuff, of course, but I think that it's something that you, you take colours of everything. You know, for me, I, I was very much inspired by my vocalist, were Paul Rogers, Ian Gillen, um, Planty, obviously, but then I listened to the Four Tops and I listened to all the Motown stuff and I worked with Diana Ross and I met Barry Gordy in the States and I saw the white thing with the black 
environment and I felt you know I felt the minority but they were so lovely and I worked you know I met Stevie Wonder and to me that was a very strange journey because it was always the music that was given to me by my sister who's seven years older so she used to always test me every week so I'd mm. go through the music charts and I'd have to sing every song so the American scene for me has always been you know it's a bucket list you know I, I, I would to, to do to support ACDC in the States or something, you know, would be pretty special. I, I, I you know, I'd love to see it properly. Um, yeah, that's where I'm at. So if you can arrange that by next week, uh, you've got my number. Uh, well, I, I did uh, get a, a buddy of mine some good press as a potential ACDC singer, but it didn't happen because Axl Rose made the phone call. Well, uh, I don't want to sing. I just want to support them. Oh, I, yeah, they, no. Well, I, 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 have, I have no power people. over that. No. <laughs> No, he's he, Brian. There's another man from uh, from planet Earth, Brian Johnson, who I, I went to a dear friend's funeral, um, uh, who who was a sponsor and a mentor of mine throughout my life. Uh, I'm going to even mention his name, Warwick Woodhouse, who was the president of, of of Getty Images, and the guy was an absolute mentor to me, and he's a beautiful man. And he passed away this year. And as I went to his funeral, I was dressed. Every, the whole thing was to wear a tie that made him laugh when we were, when he was alive. And I had this sparkly diamond tie. And there was people from the SAS and special services and military people all wearing kipper ties and pink ties and shiny ties. And I was I decided because I got there twenty minutes early. I decided to go to a, get a coffee. And I stood there and I was in Starbucks and I just picked, said a large Americano please turn around walked and I saw this guy standing at the counter and I saw his legs and I thought he looks really well trained and I saw his trainers and his new balance trainers and I thought and then I saw his watch and I thought I was wearing a decent watch but this watch was you know 120 200, 200 grand job it was a special watch and a little mask on and I turned around and he turned around and said Mike fucking hell man what are you doing in that fucking tie <laughs> brian johnson and i told him about the funeral and everything and he oh i was fucking lawrence and it's funny because lawrence has been in the industry that long that these people know him and they've all gone through the the ranks lawrence worked, lived with bruce dickinson and uh you know his life with, with joe elliott and all the, the, the early days so he's gone into the, 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 the whole rock and roll thing at the golden age and then came out during the period where I went in and I've stayed in, in, in theatre and, and music ever since. But yeah, it is a, it is a hell of a journey. And I, I, to, to gibber on, I think it's, it's, it is all about the sincerity and all about who you really are. And if your words are sincere and getting that story across and personality I, you know, Greg, mate, this next album, if you, uh, I'm not going to promise the world, but I'm just saying, if you look at the individuals, it should be very, very interesting. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, you know, it's good. It's going to be added to the list uh, when it comes out. And then, you know, uh, based upon the numbers, I think I've got at least five more years of doing this. So as long as it's out within the next five years, it'll be added to the list. I so. think we've got a lot. I think we've got a lot in common, mate. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, um, I Okay. Oh, the, the thing I wouldn't mind. See if we can find. We're going to find us a working title from your fans. Uh, well, so here's the thing. My fans are on. Uh, there, there is. I think some some skepticism uh, from my fans. So I would, I'd see what they think. Nobody's but you know, because they're like, who are you know, who are these guys? You know, taking the band that Phil was in and then trying to continue with that name and uh, singing those songs. So there's some skepticism. But I, 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 I would. I would say to the skeptics, if you had written those songs with Phil and you'd carried them songs in your heart for 30 years and not received a single penny for them, but you've got them in your head and everybody's talking about them and they've been released badly, I think the fact that Lawrence decided to go out there, I think the fact that he was there, I think the fact that they had, they lived together in East Sheen, and uh, sort of just outside in Surrey, um, uh, you know, the, I, I've, I've seen it. I've, he's got nothing to justify. I think the fact that we have the respect, we're not cashing in. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the noise that comes out of my mouth. You know, it, it is if it's what I sing. I, I don't have to sound like any. I don't want to sound like anybody. I want to sound like me. Um, and I think that, 
it will become apparent on this next album. But, you know, the first album I'm very, 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 very proud of. And for the uh, record, I, uh, I just want to say that I agree with that statement. And like from like the the writer perspective and just like, you know, knowing how it is with co-writes and demos and songs you've been carrying, like I I freaking get it. I I do disagree about the uh, the quality of the performances. Um, so I, I will disagree on that point. And well, you mean they, the performances that you hear in the the demos, the, the demos of not being very good. Uh, uh, there's 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 uh, certain instances where I will. Good. I'd say that the, the the stuff that I've heard that this Phil would never want people to listen to. You know the the way I I I look at it is like if if I were to die today, and you know I'm a different person than Phil, but like would I want people to be able to just rife through my archives of all my unfinished work? My answer is hell yes. Get all that out there because I think the art being out there is like a good in and of itself. Like I was uh, very close with the warrant camp. And so I have some demos from Janie after he died that uh, nobody has really heard that haven't been leaked. And in my opinion, I think they should be out there, but out of respect for the family, I'm not going to put them out there because I'm, I'm not a shithead. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to respect the wishes of others. But yeah. I think great songs, you know, should just be out there. And I do think the performances were great, and I think they were worthy of being out there. Um, so I, you know, I have mixed feelings on it. Uh, it. Depends on, you know, the wishes of the family. But in general, I'm just like, nah, put it out there. Though, you know, the writings of Alexander Hamilton after he dies, I say, put that out there. Let uh, let the work yeah. exist. Totally. There, there, there's there's a weird thing that happened the other day um, during lockdown. I decided to. Um, I decided to go vegan just through my own good for you and I, I've been vegan for I don't know since March last year and it's changed my life it's changed my trend tr training I would never preach to anybody well, who the hell am I to say anything but there was a post on Facebook and I just thought this is typical of humanity at the moment it was a picture of five steaks and each steak was cooked to a different um you know, up to well done and mm -hmm. from rare. And it said, how do you want your steak cooked? And I wrote underneath, alive, please. Okay. I've had probably two and a half, three thousand responses. Most of them seem to come from the same part of the world. You Nazi, you evil bastard, you absolutely, uh, depletives you could never say. Um, uh, and you suddenly think, if I've made two words, meaning that I'd like the cow to stay alive, that's only my opinion. Um, two and a half thousand people writing things. They don't know me. They, 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 it was just a, literally on a, a site. And you think, crikey. Even down to things where, uh, you know, questioning sexuality. You think, God, if I wasn't a strong man and if I'm... You know, there's there's some really really twisted keyboard warriors out there who would yeah, ne are. never say boots to a goose to anybody face to face, and that whole thing, which I think that really not patronizes you, but me taking a little sneaky peek out of what you did, and thinking, yeah, what very very good observation, what crystal and analyze the way you analyze the songs the way you pulled up and you said perhaps this and perhaps that. And I was thinking, this is fascinating. The fact that I know how we got there and you were going, they might've done this because of this. Bang on, bang on, bang on. Well, thank yeah. you. Cause every, th remember we're all people, we're all humans. Yeah. You know, these, these mythical rock stars, like Paul McCartney is still just like, he's another guy. He's just another guy who loves music. He's like, really freaking good at it. Like yeah. really freaking good at it, but he's just yeah. another guy. And so like, I never got into like the the keyboard warrior thing. I think there's you know valid reasons to criticize people, but I think you know be kind to others. You know, try to give the benefit of the doubt. That's Absolutely. just how I think you know and they should do things. Karma works in the most beautiful ways. Well, I'm I'm rooting for you guys. I'm rooting for your success. I'm rooting for you to um, be creative and vibrant uh, because. I know it's a challenge. I know it's a challenge to keep that excitement going and engage the listener. Uh, but I think that you guys have the um, like the, the right mentality. And so I'm rooting for you. But I want to ask you 
I want to touch on one more subject before we close yeah, out. Uh, sure. So I'm I'm also a musical theater nerd. Uh, so yeah. I want to I want to I want to talk theater with you because that was huh. something that I found interesting. So yeah. like. Let me put it this way. I'm a guy who I have a I have a I have an annual tradition. I get Netflix for one month out of the year when there's a new season of Cobra Kai. And uh-huh. uh month, yeah. you know, because I don't I, I can't do it every month because I'm too busy, but I'm like, all right, I'm gonna binge for a month. And I'm the guy who's like, okay, I'm gonna watch Tick Tick Boom and Vivo immediately. I'm gonna catch all the Lynn Manuel Miranda stuff on Netflix. Yeah. So yeah. I wanna know where um what are like what are some of the musicals you're into lately? What are some of your favorites? Just you know. A little okay. bit of theater chat, you know, my completely theater. alienate my audience, but I don't care because I'm I, curious. I alienate an audience. When I suddenly start singing and I suddenly move my hand, I hear things from behind me in the band going, excuse my French, stop the fucking jazz hands. <laughs> and, and they're not jazz hands because when I was in, in theater, my first review, there was two reviews I got. One from a girl called Dina Sykes at Kerrang, who wrote a beautiful, kind review. And another review from another amazing girl called Pip. Um, and that she, she was Kerrang. But they, they both pointed out, they said, it was a marquee gig. And we supported, we supported one of your bands, a pretty band. Uh, talk dirty to me. Poison. Poison, yeah. We, they we, they came over with a band called Ti- uh, Tiger. No, something to do with cats. Tiger Tales. Tiger Tales. No, they're Scottish. They're they're a Welsh band. Um, right, uh, uh, Faster, uh, White Lion. Faster, Faster Pussycat. Faster Pussycat. And um, I, we did a review at the Marquee, and the review was basically saying Mike should be in the theatre. And then when I was in the theatre, people were saying he should be in rock and roll. He should be on stage. But my theatre started when I was basically down about, I just finished working with Scott, I was down about rock and roll and somebody said, you've got a great voice, how would you like to do Jesus Christ Superstar? And I went to audition, never done anything in my life and I think I was taller than the cross and I think they were shocked that, that, that uh, when I went there and they said, you know, you're kind of too old. And then I went off and I got picked up by an agent and I trained for a year classically until I was literally working on Les Miserables and I wanted to do Valjean. And the first audition I did was Javert. And then the second audition was Jesus Christ Superstar. And they told me I was too old again. And then I did a show called Blood Brothers and they put me straight in as the lead role male uh, and I did it for three and a half years. Absolutely mind-blowing piece of theatre, which Cain and Abel, I, I'm just, I guess you know it. Um, and I did that and did my opening night at the Liverpool Empire, uh, 2,700 people, when I'd been there for two days and I was supposed to be blocking, I was supposed to be learning the, the script and Warwick, another Warwick uh, who's, who's a fantastic narrator he collapsed and I was chucked on stage Bill Kenwright was the producer and I was chucked on stage after two days of rehearsal to a packed home crowd of the Liverpool Empire which was incidentally where I saw Thin Lizzy do um, Black Rose tour but that's another story uh, but that was strange and I went off and did it all over the, did a whole European tour Loved it, loved the work of Willie Russell, loved the whole journey of the story. And then I got picked up by Notre Dame de Paris. I was playing a priest in a French uh, musical and then I played The Hunchback, which was bizarre, that was strange. And uh, musically quite interesting, very strange uh, translation by Will Jennings, uh, who wrote um, My Heart Will Go On with, um, from Titanic, but mm. I think I think Will likes to smoke, and I think he must have had a few too many smokes when he wrote the lyrics to Notre Dame de Paris for the translation, because some of it is uh, and then that's me probably never working uh, that that again. But <laughs> and then I did what did I do? Oh, I did a, a musical and I played the voice, and that was the thing that sort of uh, I, I, it was always rock and roll. It was always they needed something rocky. And then I did uh, a little bit, I, I understood it for, what did I do? Theatre, yes, that's what I did. I got pissed off with theatre and decided to write my own musical. 
uh, and I wrote a musical called Exposure. And it took me 10 years to write after the death of my father. And I put it on at the St. James Theatre in London for three months. Um, and that was a glorious period of life. It's about fake news, paparazzi. And I think if I wrote the story now, I think you, you, it's probably nothing. But at the time, it was so over the top and people going, this can't happen. But after we've had our uh, history's gone two years on from when, you know, that, that story and fake news, I think fake news is just dominated the headlines really so it's something which is very poignant and relevant now uh, but musicals yeah I kind of have a love hate with them um, I've done a couple more I can't remember what else I've done uh, yeah I did oh that's right I went back to Jesus Christ Superstar and uh, 10 years after them telling me I was too old I ended up playing Caiaphas and then I played Pontius Pilate um, which was just brilliant it was fantastic and that's rocking i mean uh i think there's a bit of plagiarism there from uh uh to, from deep purple to be honest with you when you listen to the opening score of jesus christ superstar quite straight lift um but anything in theater that's kind of rocking there's always there's always something that they, i think they don't expect the audience to be that musically aware of, of rock and roll but there's a lot of stuff that's coming out um and yeah uh i like quirky i did see a musical which i loved when i was in new york uh, called bat boy which i thought was a brilliant brilliant piece of work and, and really weird and quite funny and quite quirky and it translated well over here it was quite funny the american humor over here like uh book of mormon beautiful writing i i love i mean every night uh thank you america for you know family guy and uh, america <laughs> and south park unfortunately i'm you know i can't let my children watch it but uh you know they're, they're simpsons fans and i think the culture that we get uh is quite inspiring and i think that this period when you just you know give me give me your father lecture about the positivity of this album which i'm taking on board and i think it's damn good advice but i think we've got so much material from these two years you know i'm mm -hmm. uh, god god knows if we, you and i started talking about what we've been through this two years we, we you know we'd lose everybody now but christ almighty you couldn't make it up you just couldn't make it up could you uh yeah i've i'm i'm thinking about it now and i'm definitely uh yeah, I'm, there's there's been a lot that has happened in these two years. Ultimately, um, ultimately, I think I actually ended up in a place I would have ended up anyway. Uh, so I ended up lucky in the long run because I was I was kind of over music, uh, yeah. or rather, I was I was over working with other musicians who didn't want to do who didn't want to put in the work, and yeah. you can only do that for so many years and like toil away. And it's like I I know that man, I know like, that. When, yeah. you know, all the other guys are like, okay, this guy's high. This guy, you know, broke his hand yeah. in a fight. Uh, yeah. This guy is going to argue with you about the songs. And yeah. that's the song that the label people it, like. It's so sad because, you know, the, the Grand Slam environment that we've got is if, if it wasn't an environment that I, I, I didn't like to be in, I just simply, it doesn't mean, nothing means that much. Life means much more, more than anything. And I think that, when you've got your life and yourself sorted out, that's when damn good songs tend to come. However, having said that, my best songs would be written if my wife left me and, you know, I was sitting here with a bottle of vodka. Yeah. I don't want to I don't want to write songs like that. I think what we've gone through these past two years, we've had an amazing amount of, of, of humans making themselves look very, very, very ugly. And I think things are definitely going to change. But I also think there's this amazing... Uh, pod of love I'm not sounding like a space you know I'm not space cadet there's this amazing help there's people doing the most incredible things and I think you know as, as long as we don't get bloody uh, Russia invading the Ukraine um, you know that will be very sad but I think you know we, we've all kind of the west has kind of gone to sleep but you know no war's ever done anything I always I often think about there's a lyric I wrote the other day what was what would happen if there was a war and nobody turned up I do 
you know, I, I kind of think that there's a, that's kind of the state at the moment where governments are very much generations. They're in the dark ages. They're operating as if they're in the dark ages. And the humanity has certainly evolved much more than what the governments are providing with us. So I think, I think there will be a, a good rising, you know, in the, in the sense of news. News have probably put it to, uh, to the right sense, but I think, yeah, I think the, the, the world is definitely changing and I think we're in a, a very, very lucky place to be and if we can get through it, if we can survive. Amen. A amen. I think that's a, that's a great place to end it. Uh, plugs, tell the people where they can find you, where you want them to follow you, what you want the people to do. I would love the people to go to grand, uh, www.grandslamrocks.com uh, and find us uh, Grand Slam Rocks on Twitter and Facebook uh, Grand Slam Rocks. And we're out on the road in the UK, which obviously uh, we will let you know when we head over to your side of the pond, which is imminent. Um, and yeah, just hope to be, uh, hope this world all heals itself, which it looks as if it's going to. Um, You're a little same... bit more optimistic about that than I am currently. No, no. When I say heals itself, I, I mean, uh, plague wise, I think. The oh next... yeah, no, that's fine. That's the next, the next effort you, you and I know we need to do something about this planet. We need to save it quickly because we are seriously running out of time and the people are just doing nothing about it. And you can see, you can see it burning up. You can see the state of, of uh, and pollution. And I think most of the planet's walking around in absolute denial. I, I just feel heartbroken. This is a thing with politically, I'll, uh, you could edit this if you want. Uh, no, I'm, leave, I'm leaving it. I'm going to be lazy, but go for it. This is the one. I, I think that there would never be any terrorism if it wasn't for Tony Blair and invasion of Afghanistan. Uh, I, I feel so much for the Afghanistanis who are trying to get over here. And there's people in boats who are sinking in the, the sea and we've lost thousands of people. And there's mentality of certain people who who are generally good and kind, who are looking at these people as if to say, shoot them with machine guns, we don't want them in our country. And I say, if it wasn't for the, the, the beautiful intervention of trying to help in the first place and all these people dispersing, we would never be in this position in the first place. So I just like the empathy of people to understand that we're all foreigners, we're all strangers mm -hmm. in a strange town, we're all doesn't matter you know especially phil linnett would explain this damn sight better than i am to be a white you know to be in a white town to be a black kid with a very very strong driven amazing inspiring mother and to have a black father you know paris who, who, who his mum wet met in, in in liverpool and it's something where god it's 2022 and, and coming up and, and the world is still in a dark age and this whole I think music is a much, a very much a, a leveler. I think it's very much a neutral. There's, it sees no color. It's 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 the best voice that we've got. It's the most powerful thing we've got. And um, happy new year. And happy new year. And I'm going to stop the recording now. But Legend. thank you so much. And where's that stop recording button?